Hi, Eric Johnson here at Vanderbilt's Owen Graduate School of Management. And I'm here today with Dane Walling. Dane is the former mayor of Flint, Michigan, uh, served two terms there in that role, and uh, was there during a very, very uh, uh, influential, critical time for the city. And uh, is going to share a little bit of that uh, with us today and some of the things he's learned. So welcome, Dane. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Well, give us a little background. What brought you to public service and what was the situation that you ended up in with Flint? Well, I'm uh, born and raised in Flint. So Flint's my hometown. And through all the challenges that the city has had with General Motors factories closing and just the, the multitude of issues that come from, uh, you know, neighborhoods with too much blight and um, you know, too much crime happening in the streets and not enough jobs for, for people who want them in the community. Um, I um, got involved in a career in local government and nonprofit advocacy and realized that I needed to go back home and do that work. Yeah. Uh, so it was just over 10 years ago that my family and I moved back to Flint. I got involved in the community and uh, ran unsuccessfully for mayor. So, you know, if you don't uh, succeed at first, then try again. I was elected my second time out. And uh, by that point, the city, the country, uh, was in the Great Recession. So coming into office, there were already, you know, just challenges after challenges with the uh, budget, with uh, the police staffing levels, um, trying to find a way to deliver basic services in a situation of really severe financial distress, yeah. which we had already been um, dealing with as a, as a chronic matter. Right. And now we had this very, very acute. acute crisis on yeah. top of that. Yeah. Uh, our largest employer, General Motors, is going through bankruptcy. Uh, there were just so many questions and, and so many challenges. But nevertheless, a lot of great people in the community, a lot of um, institutions, um, colleges, universities, medical centers, businesses that we all love and, and want to find ways to support. And that's, that's what motivated me every day and was mayor. And then you ended up with this water crisis. That was really the tipping point in all of this. Yeah, with the financial distress, we, were, we ended up with a state-appointed emergency manager who legally had the authority of myself and the city council uh, to make decisions, and those were often made behind closed doors. Uh, decisions weren't getting enough public scrutiny. Uh, there was not enough independent uh, assessment. Um, the kinds of things you'd want to see when there was a really highly consequential like uh, water system decision being made. So um, one thing after another over the course of about a year and a half, we, we kept learning, um, okay, this treatment wasn't being done right, this filter wasn't installed, uh, these tests weren't being done, and it was just you know problem after problem. I, I felt like I was working on water every day, but the, the problem kept getting uh, bigger and more severe. And how did you lead through that or manage that, particularly with this uh, emergency manager that was in some sense, the, the city was kind of in receivership in a certain way. It, right? it was, and it was a period of almost four years. We had four different individuals who served in that appointed capacity. Um, I was that uh, mayor, that was my second term in office at that point. So yeah, I tried to uh, continue to advance my agenda of making Flint um, a sustainable 21st century city, which is what I talked about as I went door to door through the community. I wanted to uh, see us have a long-term plan to have a more diverse economy, um, to have a, you know, a great park system, to have a, a network of community businesses that could really meet the needs of our local residents, regardless of which neighborhood you lived in. And uh, I was able to guide a long-term planning process. It was one of the things that the emergency managers uh, assigned me to continue to work on. So I was able to make some great progress there. We put together a plan called imagineflint.com that you can go in and take a look at and see what we came up with as a vision. And um, I also tried to stay connected to the community. Uh, my door at the mayor's office was open every Wednesday morning for two hours for people to come in. I, I didn't have the authority to solve all those problems, but I, I, was, I was trying to listen to the community, uh, see what was happening, not just on water, but also with safety and schools sure, and sure. You know, sanitation and, and all the other services that make up a, a city. So um, it was not easy 
going into that mm -hmm. environment without the authority, without the public transparency, um, the oversight role of city council, which you know, I didn't always enjoy sitting at city council meetings, yeah, but it's a vital part of our democracy sure, for sure. there to be oversight and yeah. for people to be involved. And, and that just wasn't, that wasn't happening. Sure. And, you know, still along the way, it was this ongoing water crisis and this uh, fateful decision. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what did you learn from that? When you look at it again, you know, obviously you, 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 you wish you could undo that decision or make a different decision, but how does that informing the way you think about big decisions in the future. Yeah, well, you're so right. You, when something goes wrong at that scale, uh, you wish you could go back in time and, and get on a totally different track. Um, but what, what I've taken from it more than anything was the expertise and the partnerships that, that have come to be part of the city's recovery uh, we needed to have that expertise and those partnerships and resources at the start of the process. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was amazing to see citizens get involved in testing their own water and our local medical community looking at records and discovering, you know, tr tragically that, that children were being poisoned by lead. But that information was what then allowed us to put solutions in place. Uh, the last thing I did in office was actually get the city reconnected to the former Detroit water system. Mm -hmm. So getting the right partnerships, resources, independent expertise in on the front end of the process, that's that's what I just can't emphasize mm -hmm. to, to anyone So enough. if you were stepping up to a big decision like this, again, or advising someone, your advice would be to really get more input into that decision, more of these processes. Up, up in front, yeah. right. And and not not wait to see what goes wrong and then find someone who has the expertise to fix it. Uh, we had a, a researcher from Virginia Tech who did an independent uh, analysis of the city's water testing. Um, his expertise, um, if I'm ever in that position again, will be utilized first, you know, not, not later. Yeah. So uh, double checking, uh, I even say triple checking uh, because we had the state and to some degree federal officials involved, but we still weren't getting the full story and we needed the, the state, the federal and the independent resources. Uh, I think in some cases businesses could provide that independent resource, uh, colleges and universities, mm -hmm. medical professionals. Uh, that's, that's the biggest takeaway for me is get the resources in place first and make sure that there's a degree of independence about that expertise um, because you don't just want to hear the same thing. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to truly understand entirely what what's happening, what could happen. Mm -hmm. So through all these experiences, I'd love to share a leadership lesson, something you'd like to pass on uh, to our audience. Well, I, I think, and this may relate to my commitment to the Flint community, I, I never had uh, said to anyone that there's going to be some quick fix. I mean, this is even before we had the water crisis. I, I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to think long-term. And um, that, that's where having partnerships, uh, having coalitions and networks, really paying attention to whether it's our community or our customers in a very serious way, uh, those things all take time. Um, in, in the rush to get things done, they may uh, feel like it's, it's too much work to reach out to somebody new or build a relationship with an institution that's not in our normal you know, sphere. But I think those, those long-term relationships, that's what really builds the sustainability and the resilience. And if we could all be a little more intentional about doing that, mm -hmm then I think that just makes our, our institutions, our organizations, our businesses, communities, it makes them stronger in the long run. And if, and if as leaders we don't put that time in to do the long-term work, then, then who else will? You know, who else will? So we yeah. have to, I think, set an example and, and it's something that I'm even you know, more committed to now and, and feel like I can use this unique experience to understand uh, how to do that even better. Mm -hmm. But as business and community leaders, I think 
we all realize there's a lot of impatience in our stakeholders. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it, it's great to talk right. about long term, but people want to know what's going to happen in, th in three know, weeks and, or three months. Right? And there's reasons for yeah, that, yeah. right? Because we, we do have to also be... Um, you know, task driven and, and we have to look at what we're doing monthly and quarterly, but there is a need to, you know, take that step back and, and ask, you know, what am I missing? Why, why is this pattern persisting despite the efforts we're, we're taking? And, and I think that those answers are likely going to come from, you know, people who are outside of our existing network. So we have to really challenge ourselves to you know, find the new voice, find the new expert, find the new partner. Um, and that's, uh, like I said, if, if, if we don't do that as leaders, then I, I don't know who else, who else will. Yeah. Well, Dane, thanks so much for yeah, it's a spending the day at Vanderbilt with us. Thank you, Dean.